Welcome listeners and thank you for joining us. Today we have with us a longtime Live Derm faculty member and South Beach Symposium Planning Committee member, Dr. Christopher Bunick. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, thank you. So we just have a few questions for you today if you'll indulge us. The first is, we know a number of different targeted therapies have been approved by the FDA in you know, most recent years for treatment of patients with eczema or atopic dermatitis. What are some of those standout therapies that have been added to the eczema treatment toolkit? Yeah, I think this is a very important point to make about the treatment of atopic dermatitis patients. When I was about 10 years ago, when I was just fresh out of residency, we really didn't have any advanced therapies. We were still using traditional immunosuppressive medications like methotrexate, cyclosporin, uh, as well as systemic corticosteroids like prednisone to treat some of our moderate to severe atopic dermatitis patients. But what really shook the field up was around six or seven years ago when dupilumab was launched, it gave us a targeted biologic, right? Inhibiting the IL-4 and IL-13 pathways in order to treat these severe atopic dermatitis patients. And for many years, that was the only option that our atopic dermatitis patients had in terms of targeted precision medicine, such as a, a biologic like dupilumab. And there was clearly a need for other therapies because not all patients respond to the same medicine. And different patients, it was very clear that not all patients were responding to dupilumab and different patients that needed an alternative it needed to be an alternative that wasn't going backwards to traditional immunosuppressive therapy. While they can be helpful for patients that are not responding to a biologic, there needed to be something that was more targeted for atopic dermatitis and also more effective and safer. And so that's where we now have in our dermatology repertoire for atopic dermatitis, four advanced systemic therapies that are currently FDA approved. We have dupilumab, we have trilokinumab now entering that biologic space. So when I counsel patients, we really talk about the biologic therapies and then the small molecule therapies, which are the JAK inhibitors, which we'll get to in a second. But when I talk about biologics, we have two major players right now. We have the dupilumab and we also have now trilokinumab, which is a IL-13 specific inhibitor different than dupilumab, which can reduce both the IL-4 and IL-13 signaling. So we have a slightly more targeted biologic in the trilokinumab, but there's physiology showing that IL-13 may be a key or the key driver in atopic dermatitis uh, pathophysiology. Uh, that being said, what we know is that actually atopic dermatitis is a very heterogeneous disease. And what that means is that Again, not every patient is exactly the same. There are multiple cytokines. While IL-4 and IL-13 may be the more dominant cytokines, there are other cytokines that drive atopic dermatitis. And because of that, that is why we now have an entire new set of medicines called JAK inhibitors approved in atopic dermatitis. So here in the United States, we have here in the United States, we have abrocitinib and upadacitinib. In Europe, they also have baricitinib approved for the use of atopic dermatitis. But here in the US, we have two. And what's really interesting about these molecules, these JAK inhibitors, is they are small molecules. They are working inside the cell. The biologics, the dupilumab, the trilokinumab, and the other biologic that's currently not approved in the US, but is under investigation and close to being approved, levocizumab, they all work outside the cell right? They're working at the cytokine and receptor level outside the cell, whereas the JAK inhibitors are working inside the cell to inhibit that signal transduction into the nucleus of the cell where transcriptional programs are ultimately altered to drive inflammation and skin disease. And so what's really fascinating about abrocitinib and upadacitinib is these new small molecules. They're the new kids on the block over the past uh, couple of years or so. And What's fascinating is that in the most recent network meta-analysis, kind of trying to indirectly compare the efficacy of these advanced systemic therapies, uh, it turns out that the JAK inhibitors prove to be highly efficacious. And the three most uh, successful or efficacious medicines uh, for achieving both easy 75 and easy 90 response are JAK inhibitors, the upadacitinib. 30 milligram dose, 
the abracitinib 200 milligram dose, and then the upadacitinib 15 milligram dose. Those three medicines actually are achieving uh, above 40% easy 90 response at around 16 weeks. And so the, the efficacy of these medicines is uh, revolutionizing the treatment of atopic dermatitis. So uh, I think that the best way to think about these standout therapies is that we now have uh, some biologics to be able to use in different patients in different scenarios. And now we have small molecule inhibitors inside the cell to use with different patients. And each of these has um, uh, strengths. And I think that the majority of, of atopic dermatitis patients can do well with these medicines. And I think that one of the other aspects that we're we're looking at, is particularly with the JAK inhibitors, is the, the speed of onset of some of the itch relief that can occur uh, with these particular molecules. We know that atopic dermatitis patients tend to be very itchy. And a lot of the patients, they would just want that itch to go away. And I think that the, the rapid onset of itch relief in uh, the JAK inhibitors has been a welcome addition to that type of therapy needed by our atopic dermatitis patients. And certainly that's not to say that the biologics can't reduce itch. They also do. And this is why having all of these uh, tools at our disposal is, is incredibly important. In addition to the systemic advanced therapies that I just described, both the biologics and the small molecule JAK inhibitors that, that are taken by mouth, uh, we also saw uh, recently approved a, a topical JAK inhibitor, or ruxolitinib, for those patients who maybe have more mild to moderate disease or more limited disease, maybe less than 20% body surface area, that don't want to go to that systemic medicine. So having a topical agent that's non-steroidal having a topical agent that can be more effective against that multi-cytokine heterogeneous disease of atopic dermatitis has been also a game changer. We're seeing it used in multiple areas, such as on the face where you uh, may maybe don't want to use steroids long-term. We're seeing it being used uh, on the hands for chronic uh, atopic dermatitis of the hands, and it's proven very uh, efficacious. So not only have we seen huge advances in the oral systemic therapies, but also there's constant uh, desire to improve the topical therapies uh, that our patients are receiving. And I think one of the emphasis uh, that's being made is how do we develop targeted advanced therapies topically that are non-steroidal, right? How can we move away from uh, the steroids in order to use uh, molecules uh, that are more efficacious, but safer than the long-term chronic steroid use. And we know that there's other molecules uh, currently under investigation in clinical trial for uh, specifically a non-steroidal use in atopic dermatitis, including reflumolast, uh, as well as tepenorof. And so we may see that despite we're talking about all these amazing additions to our toolkit to take care of our, our patients with atopic dermatitis, that toolkit's going to get even bigger. And I think that the analogy that a lot of dermatologists uh, make is that in psoriasis, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we had, you know, a few medicines trickle in and then boom, now we have uh, a dozen or more uh, advanced medicines, as well as continued development of advanced topicals. And, and the field is just saturated with really good, effective medicines to help our patients. And I think that we're seeing that, that revolution, that boom in atopic dermatitis. So that there's also, besides the topicals uh, coming, there's a lot more uh, uh, biologics, uh, as well as JAK inhibitors coming uh, down the pike uh, in atopic dermatitis and related uh, Disease, inflammatory diseases. Thank you for that. Now, many clinicians, patients, parents, caregivers, etc., you know, they've expressed concerns over the box warnings that they see for emerging JAK inhibitor therapies for atopic dermatitis. What can clinicians do to put their patients at ease and to be more knowledgeable and confident about prescribing these newer therapies despite any potential safety risks? Well, I think that this is the first natural response to to any patient to starting a new medicine is is it safe I, we have uh, a natural inherent uh, uh, biological uh, desire to protect ourselves and and stay safe and so it's it's a natural thing to question 
are these medicines safe, especially when you see a boxed warning slapped onto the, the product label uh, saying, wait a second, there may be something dangerous here. And, and I think that when I counsel patients and other physicians about boxed warnings, I think there are a few things that you have to keep in mind. And number one is that a boxed warning does not mean do not use the medicine, right? It's a very different. I think that the initial response, the fear response is, oh, I shouldn't use it. But that's not what a box warning means. A box warning means that this medicine may be very helpful for a patient, but there are certain things you need to consider both as the physician and in how you counsel and work with the patient to make sure that that medicine is administered safely and that the patient is monitored, monitored appropriately. And I think that that's what we've seen happen over the approximately couple of years the JAK inhibitors have been uh, available for atopic dermatitis is that what we've seen is that the box warning itself, the hype over how dangerous these medicines are because the FDA put a boxed warning on the, the JAK inhibitors in dermatology is not necessarily jiving with the excellent safety record that we're seeing from the, the oral JAK inhibitors uh, through long-term safety data. And so one of the, I think that the, of the two JAK inhibitors, the one that has the longest safety data right now is uh, published is the upadacitinib. And the four-year safety data of upadacitinib was really remarkable because there was very minimal rates of malignancy. There were no, no incidences of uh, gastrointestinal perforation, incredibly low rates of venous thromboembolism. In fact, in the data, 20% of the women were on OCPs and zero developed venous thromboembolism. And then uh, we talked about the malignancy, we talked about the, the, the venous thromboembolism, but also then when you come down to uh, major cardiovascular adverse events, uh, they're incredibly low. And one of the things that it's very important is to take the rates of these events. So we call it events per 100 patient years. And when we look at those events, per 100 patient years and compare it to background rates, you find that the JAK inhibitors are either equal or better than a lot of the background rates, either in the, the healthy population or the moderate to severe AD population. And, and so I think that one of the things that dermatologists need to step back and think about is what are the rates of adverse events for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis patients on the JAK inhibitors compared to your normal moderate to severe atopic dermatitis patients that are not getting the oral JAK inhibitors compared to the healthy population. And when you do this comparison and you realize that the JAK inhibitors, in fact, some of the patients, for example, in the venous thromboembolism category, patients on JAK inhibitors actually have lower rates of venous thromboembolism because of the anti-inflammatory, we believe the anti-inflammatory effect of the JAK inhibitors is protective. And so what we're learning as more and more long-term safety data comes out, and I think the abracitinib data uh, is very similar to the upadacitinib data and constantly showing that, that consistent safety over long-term. And, and what we're seeing is that the initial fear of the JAK inhibitors uh, is not necessarily as bad as we thought. Actually, it's the opposite, that the JAK inhibitors are not only proving to be the most efficacious therapies uh, for many of our patients with atopic dermatitis, but they also are proving to be incredibly safe. And this is important because when you're counseling uh, patients about boxed warnings, one of the things to, to, that I often like to say is that boxed warnings also occur in over-the-counter medicines that you use every day. And so just because it's a boxed warning, it doesn't mean the medicine is necessarily bad for you or going to be dangerous for you. But it does mean that we have to use our brains, we have to think logically, and we have to do the proper blood monitoring and uh, counseling of our patients what to look for. And, and also selection of patients. We, you know, if someone's above the age of 65 and has significant cancer, clotting, or cardiovascular history, maybe that's not the right patient to put on the, the oral JAK inhibitor. But that's why having this large toolkit of new advanced therapies is so important is because there are options to help that patient. So when I so going back to the, the boxed warning, what I tell patients is that ibuprofen, there's pretty much 
every person in America takes ibuprofen, uh, except, except for those allergic. Most people use ibuprofen here and there, but it has a boxed warning and it's over the counter and there's no one regulating it. Really, you can take as much ibuprofen as you want when you buy it over the counter uh, within reason without hurting yourself. And the ibuprofen itself, some of the warnings for cardiovascular and GI issues are not that dissimilar to the JAK inhibitors. And I think that patients, when they understand that even ibuprofen has a boxed warning, it, it decreases the stigma around a boxed warning. So when you're dealing with patients uh, that maybe don't have a medical background, the idea of a boxed warning or any type of warning in society carries a stigma of dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. And so what we want to do is we want to decrease that stigma. So not saying it's dangerous, but more saying that this box warning is just meant to make us physicians protect the patients better and for the patients to gain that knowledge, how to use the medicine appropriately and to make sure that they're being cared for properly by the physicians. And so it's really a, a partnership between the physician and the patient to make sure that it's being used in the right patient at the right time, right dose uh, with the right monitoring. And I think it's sort of, that's the way I, I approach it. And I, I would like to add that a lot of people don't realize that there's inconsistency with how box warnings are applied in the JAK inhibitor space. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that topical ruxolitinib has the same boxed warning as the oral Upadacitinib and abracitinib in, in the US in dermatology. But the question is, well, why doesn't the oral ruxolitinib used in oncology have a boxed warning? The, pot, the product label for oral ruxolitinib has the exact same side effects as the other JAK inhibitors, but it doesn't have a boxed warning. And I think this is a really good example of the inconsistency of how how boxed warnings were applied. They were slapped on all the dermatology drugs, topical and oral. But then when you look at the oncology space, well, their drug doesn't have a boxed warning and it's an oral JAK inhibitor. And I think that this, this type of inconsistency also just is, an, is a reminder to us clinicians that everything with a boxed warning isn't necessarily bad. You have to look into the details and you have to understand the context of how the warnings are applied and what it really means for the patient. And so in summary, what I would say uh, with regard to box warnings and safety, and this is a topic I like talking about a lot, is something to just keep in mind is that the long-term safety data at JAK inhibitors is actually incredibly optimistic and favorable that the JAK inhibitors are going to have uh, a long-lasting impact on our atopic dermatitis patients for, for decades to come. That's great, Dr. Bunick, so insightful. Um, despite the latest innovations in these targeted advanced therapies, what gaps do you think persist uh, when managing patients with atopic dermatitis? Yeah, I, I think there are several gaps and, and well, let's cover a couple of them here. So one of the first gaps is just clinically. Let's start clinically. When you have a, a moderate to severe atopic dermatitis patient, uh, one of the, that, that's not responding to a therapy, whether it's a biologic therapy or a small molecule therapy, one of the biggest questions that clinicians are raising is, how do I know when to switch medicines? When do you give up on that biologic or when do you give up on that JAK inhibitor? One of the things that I like emphasizing is that when it comes to biologics in particular, and this is true both in the atopic dermatitis space and the psoriasis space, uh, most biologics achieve steady state levels in the body at around four months. So what I mean by achieving steady state at four months is that in order to really know if a biologic therapy is going to work, it may take up to those four months until the person, the patient achieves that steady state level to really have an idea if it's working. And I think that's why many clinicians uh, use around four to six months to know whether that biologic is truly uh, effective or not. And I think that there's, you know, obviously uh, there's, uh, you know, pharmacologic data to, to support that four to six month window. But if the patient's been on a biologic beyond, you know, beyond six months and is not having successful uh, resolution of their atopic dermatitis, 
then you really ought to start thinking about switching medicines to uh, either a different biologic or to the JAK inhibitor class. So that leads to the next uh, gap in knowledge is, well, when you're switching, how do you actually define a failure in atopic dermatitis? So there's the question of when to switch, but then there's the question of, well, what, what is the actual criteria that defines a failure in, in treatment by these advanced systemic uh, medicines? And this is a little tricky. Uh, and I, I do think that there are certain criteria that you can use, whether it's using the EZ75, the EZ90, or the itch uh, NRS scale. Uh, so something I, I like to consider is that if you have, you know, we're in an era now where these medicines are working so well that if someone isn't achieving a certain uh, level of, of itch reduction on the numeric rating scale, uh, then they're not necessarily uh, fully responded, right? We should be able to achieve itch of zero or one a, a, a response is itch of zero or one. And if someone's between two and five, then they're, they're only partially responders. And if they're, you know, an itch of six to 10, then they're, they're, they're a non-responder. And I, I think that that's one good way to look at itch uh, as a criterion for, for whether someone's responded or not. We're in an era where, you know, the JAK inhibitors and, and some of the biologics are achieving easy 90 uh, in a number of patients. And so if you're, if you're seeing our goal should be to get all the atopic dermatitis patients to, you know, at least 50% easy 90. And so if a patient's below 50% easy 90, I think you could consider them uh, not completely uh, controlled disease. And then if someone is, if we go to a little bit less stringent criteria and look at easy 75, if someone's below 50% uh Easy 75, I think you, you also can consider them to be uh, poorly controlled in their atopic dermatitis. And so I think that using some criteria, whether it's the itch numeric rating scale, the easy 50, the easy 75, uh, I think that finding those parameters uh, where we, we can define, you know, complete response, partial response, ineffective response, uh, it, there needs to be more research and more focus on it. And, and that's going to help uh, clinicians know uh, when and how to change. Because I think it, what becomes very difficult is when someone comes into the office, a patient comes into the office and they say, you know, I'm 50% better. Well, you're, you're kind of like, well, they're 50% better. Should I stop that therapy? What if they get worse if I switch to the new therapy? But they might get better. And, and I think that having some guidelines like that, that, that are really algorithmic as opposed to more uh, subjective uh, is going to be helpful. And I th so I think that that's a gap where research needs to, to go. And the, the last main gap uh, with atopic dermatitis that I'd like to, to point out um, is, is really how do we actually remit disease? So I think we're seeing a big push to understand how do we actually get patients either off medicines, right? So patients that have been on medicines for several years and their disease is absolutely controlled are starting to ask the question, well, can I come off of it? And the answer for most of the current therapies is no, that, that you're not getting true disease remission for years in most of these patients. Now, there are exceptions to that. But I think that what you're seeing in the research is that there's a push to, towards uh, two things. There's a push towards therapies that are less frequently dosed, which is not necessarily the same thing as true remission, but you're seeing uh, a lot of uh, emphasis by companies that can they create that skyrizy like molecule for atopic dermatitis that's dosed every three months. And so you, I, I do think that's where you're going to see a lot of innovation going forward is trying to reduce the frequency of dosing. Uh, but also that, again, that's separate from remission. So how do we actually teach the immune system to, to just stop the inflammation for long periods of time. And the immunologist and, and you know, dermatology specialists that specialize in you know, immunologic research are really focused on that question. Can we make therapies that are more remittive for long periods of time, six months, a year or longer? Now, I, is it going to lead to a cure one day? Uh, maybe not. But I do think that you're going to see, and this may be true even in the psoriasis space, 
a lot of emphasis on focused on disease remission. So, so I think those are the, some of the few big gaps and, and a few ways to, to try to address those gaps. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Bunick. We have one last question for you. So the 22nd annual South Beach Symposium will return to Miami Beach this coming February 2024, where you will be giving lectures such as demystifying jack inhibitors, myths versus science, and faculty versus faculty, biologics versus jack inhibitors for atopic dermatitis. What can attendees who want to learn more about managing atopic dermatitis hope to gain from these sessions come February? I'm very excited about the South Beach Symposium in Miami in February of 2024. It's going to be a fantastic meeting, and I'm really excited about talking uh, about atopic dermatitis on a couple fronts. So the talk, Demystifying Jack Inhibitors, Myths First Science, is really going to dive in deep to understanding what's real about boxed warnings, what's real about efficacy, and what's real about safety of JAK inhibitors and how do we use the science to overcome some of the, the myths and concerns that have come up in, our, in dermatology over the last year or two surrounding JAK inhibitors. So we're going to cover all of those uh, key things, efficacy, safety, and boxed warnings, and really kind of dispel some of the rumors and myths that, that I think may hinder clinicians from using these medicines, but also maybe hinder patients from getting better if, if they're not being put on these medicines when appropriate. And then the second talk is going to be a, a really exciting one, uh, comparing you know, biologics and JAK inhibitors for atopic dermatitis. I, I think that this particular uh, faculty versus faculty session is going to really try to just emphasize when to use these medicines in particular patients. Now, not every patient responds to every medicine. And I think that people understand that. But how do you choose? What's the pros and cons of each of the biologics? And what are the pros and cons of each of the JAK inhibitors? I think that it's uh, easy to get caught up and, and just maybe you, you get comfortable with one medicine and you always prescribe one medicine uh, because you got experience when you do things that way. But what we're hoping to accomplish with the biologics versus JAK inhibitors for AD is to give a context of how to use all of the medicines in patients when appropriate, what patients are going to do well uh, with the various biologics and the various JAK inhibitors, and point out the strengths and weaknesses and where uh, the specialty uh, can really advance forward in applying these different advanced therapies in, in the right way for our patients. So without going into too much detail, and, uh, but that, that particular uh, this particular uh, talk at, at South Beach is, is bound to be very uh, exciting, but also controversial because it's very important that you know, not every dermatologist practices the same, right? East Coast dermatologists may be different than West Coast, North versus South, or you know, one state versus another. Not all dermatologists practice the same. And so this is going to give uh, attendees a, a, a opportunity to hear some different positions on how these advanced therapies are used in in the clinics of myself and uh, Dr. Brett King, who will be doing this session with me. That's great. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Bunick. We really appreciate it.